Thanks, Mark, for uh, for the kind words. I don't know if I'll be as inspiring as Alex there, but um, <coughs> at the very least, I'll I'll try and make it somewhat interesting. Um, so uh, a little bit of a commercial today uh, um, on who BMO is beyond what you might know about our Canadian retail operations. Uh, for those in the crowd that don't know, BMO is actually North America's eighth largest bank by assets with over 500 billion. Uh, we're actually larger in the U.S. than any other single market, despite our obviously name uh, and, and uh, history in, in Montreal, and actually being Canada's first bank. Uh, we have over 2,000 employees uh, within the capital markets division, with really a focus on combining bulge bracket capabilities with a mid cap focus across North America. Um, in terms of you know, page two really outlines some of our broader technology and communications backgrounds. What I would leave, this is the necessary commercial before I get on to the more interesting stuff, but what I would leave you with is, you know, it, BMO, despite its nature or despite its mechanizations being in Montreal and in Canada, it's a very diversified platform advising both private and public companies on all of their capital needs. And it was interesting what Alex threw out there in terms of both from a venture side, private debt side, wherever else, we really do touch every bit of the capital structure, uh, all the way from uh, Series A and, and Series B, where we work with a number of prominent venture capitalists, all the way through the public markets. So we get a good feel of what investors are looking for. I think Alex put it perfectly, uh, whether it's on the VC side, in terms of building products gets you there and getting there quicker um, to the public markets. And where, you know, while for a lot of cases, uh, venture is willing to take a risk, public markets aren't in a lot of cases. And those that show sustainability and growth and, and predictability are often best served within uh, the public markets. That being said, there are opportunities for uh, excellence and for striving for that goal and growth in the public markets that I would say uh, it existed about 20 years ago or even 15 years ago, uh, went away uh, over the last decade, but it's very much on the back of the success in the venture world is being uh, coming very much uh, front and center. So a little bit of background on the capital markets itself. Everybody kind of has been probably staring at their portfolio, wondering how am I ever going to retire here or how am I going to raise any money. Um, in, in 2015, uh, later part of 2015, and then definitely the early part of 2016, uh, has been pretty tumultuous. Um, that being said, you know there are signs of uh, future stability. Even last week, the equity markets um, finished higher on Friday afternoon as oil prices, which affects a lot of people in this room and, and funding availability and capital. Uh, started to stabilize and, and people started to look ahead to where the Fed is actually speaking and is it following the FMOC meeting. In the meantime, you know, our strategists at BMO Capital Markets have predicted uh, the, unfortunate, uh, uh, the unfortunate level that the, the TSX would test new lows of around 1800 this year. Now, while the markets have moved towards these levels at the start of January faster than most predicted, um, it, there are indications that there's some fundament, fundamental supports at these levels that allow us to get through the inevitable correction early on in the rear. Um, on the new issue front and raising capital, what I would say, you know, January officially included no IPO pricings, uh, marking only the third time since 1990 that year that it's kicked off. Uh, without a January transaction. Most recently, an IPO last January occurred in 2009, uh, following a weak second half in 2008 and missed the financial crisis, which only kind of really priced six deals in six months. That being said, what all this volatility did was resulted in a significant slowdown in IPO activity in, 20, in the latter part of 2015. In the overall, however, 2015 proved to be a very strong IPO market, particularly north of the border. 19 various issues were priced, raising over five, almost close to $5 billion across a range of sectors. In the U.S. market, and this is really where you're going to see a lot of the capital, uh, uh, particularly in, in, in the small satellite sector, be focused on, over 169 IPOs priced, raising 36 
$8 billion. Meanwhile, 2015 saw the, uh, the lightest fourth quarter issuance market since the financial crisis. So from a public markets perspective, based on all of those points, not the rosiest of pictures. That being said, what I thought was um, interesting was in contrast, from a cap public capital raising, from an M&A perspective, uh, technology M&A maintained its positive momentum through 2015 with over 100, uh, with over 315 billion dollars in M&A, twice that of 2014 occurring in uh, in 2015, and that ranges a lot, uh, less so from the sexy software sector or e-commerce sector, but even from the hardware sector. So to get back to the point, where is the value often attributed to? It's when people build things. Software still remains a very focused area or a very uh, high area of interest for uh, various venture capitalists and whatnot. But making real goods does result in real value. So in the meantime, in the private market, strong VC performance has led to an increase in VC fundraising. VC investments outperform the public markets at a rate much higher, almost double that than historically expected. 21% over the last year versus 14% in the public markets versus the differential over a 10 year period being 10 and 8. So what that ended up being is lots and lots of dry powder ended up flowing into the private capital markets. And what that ended up doing was leading to a rapid increase in companies delaying access to the public markets, particularly given the market volatility, uh, and accelerating the sheer number of unicorns, so over 160 in the United States. To put this in perspective, from 2008 to 2011, only 20 companies across North America achieved a value of over a billion dollars. Let me repeat that again. Only 20 companies achieved a value of over a billion dollars. In 2012, there was 10. In 2015, there were 72. So what does this all mean? Well, in Canada, what this has played out is many Canadian companies have been followed suit, accessing private markets to achieve digital scale and investor awareness. This has proved highly successful for a number of companies with growth equity investment, and that would be a little bit, it's almost the no air land between VC and private equity, which has been a huge area uh, of growth from a capital perspective. Growth equity investment remaining on the rise as companies are looking for capital plus strategies. Uh, and that's the biggest part that I want to leave on a lot of people here. This isn't uh, simple, you know, I don't want to call it for lack of better words, dumb money. This is money that can help you expand your Rolodex, that can help you drive growth. Something more than just a bag of money, but actually a true partner. And a number of can Canadian companies are doing that across a number of industries which are recent investments are outlined on the bottom of this page. And these include Canadian companies attracting capital from both Canadian investors and U.S. investors. What well, once used to be, the Canadian BC landscape used to be littered with uh, a few select funds being able to cherry pick the best and the brightest uh, for their portfolios. What you've seen over the last couple of years because of this dynamic, the U.S. investors view Canada as one of the biggest opportunities uh, for investment. You have a ed highly educated workforce, relatively low uh, median salaries versus the Valley, an engineer in the Valley can make over $160,000 a year, coming right out of undergrad in sunny Waterloo, that's 48, maybe 70. That's half the cost. So really what company, what this has ended up resulting in is a market which is allowed uh, which is really poised for future growth. And let me get back to the unicorn thing. So, so great. Well, public markets have been volatile. Lots of companies have been able to raise lots of money at incredible values. What, what could possibly go wrong? So there have only been 26 enterprise technology IPOs valued at greater than $1 billion since 2002. 26. Remember that 160 number that I just talked about. There have only been 19 acquisitions of VC backed companies greater than 1 billion since 2002. Only nine are enterprise technology companies. 
And against this market drop, backdrop, what you've already, everybody's probably read, is leaving many to question the existence of, of unicorns themselves. And there's been a whole bunch of different things on it. Uh, acronyms that I'm not going to use in front of a public crowd. But what's the lesson? And the lesson really is the following. There's lots and lots of capital available, but stretching for every last dollar may work for some, but not work for most. And to Alex's point, when you're looking for a capital partner, uh, you're looking for just that. You're looking for a partner. And, and partners come in different forms. They can be VCs, they can be angel investors, private net worth, public markets, whatever else. But I guess the point what I would leave to you is, or, or a suggestion I would leave to you is, the, some of the most successful companies out there, the ones that have been able to maintain that billion dollar plus value, the ones that have been able to grow and become real businesses or divisions within businesses or get bought out at a ridiculous value, is not because they stretched along the way. They found the right partner, created a fair ecosystem, created a fair structure, fair price, and drove towards a common goal. If any of those variables differ, I caution who you end up uh, partnering with. So in terms of the satellite industry specifically, let's, let's kind of get to that. I, I liked this that I came upon from uh, the New Space Global Small side report, your consultant, please don't yell at me. Um, but over the past decade, roughly two and a half billion dollars has been invested in small satellites, and it's a really an area of significant interest for private and public investors alike. So why is it of interest? Because unlike many industries, space and satellite remains a large and growing and more importantly, sustainable market. Interest in small satellites, uh, has grown to a number of different factors, substantial cost reduction, small sites provide, improving technologies and applications, and lastly, further connectivity, particularly for remote locations and for moving targets such as maritime ships. With a market represented by, not only is, is these the various areas of growth, but it's a market represented by a diverse group of investors and players focusing on dozens of existing, this is not new technologies, it's on existing market opportunities. They basically are saying, or the, big, the basic crux is, I don't have to create a market, the market's already there. And the more you can actually prove that your technologies or your plans are addressing a market that already exists, great. The key will be is always identifying what that larger scale opportunity ends up being in the long term. And so, what are those larger longer term or large scale opportunities? Well, there's a whole bunch an array of various growth segments it, with space satellites addressing some of the biggest areas of growth, including video and fixed data, servicing multiple old industries, as I said, existing markets like agriculture, cargo ships, and new industry market segments such as connected cars. So that diversification and growth potential has subsequently backed by is been subsequently backed by real dollars, reflected in recent financing and consolidation activity, whether it be O3B's network raising $460 million in December of 2015. And remember the market I just talked about? How tumultuous it was? They raised a Series H totaling $460 million. And more locally, your Ethercast completed two follow-on offerings last year, including in June, on the back of what was a uh, degraded market raising over $120 million from public investors. So the market is spoken and is behind the opportunity. So where do the dollars come from really depends on the various stage. And one area that I could put on here and I didn't is that private net worth investor, but also the angel. Largely in Canada, that unfortunately falls into the venture capital realm, but that's been evolving. So, in terms of the forms of capital, where can you look to? So, in the venture capital side, the markets reported a strong year in 2015, and these players are largely focused on startups and early stage companies who are yet to stop be established, but show great promise. That huge opportunity set addressing that. On the private equity or growth equity side, while the market somewhat lagged, this, there is a tremendous interest 
in local Canadian technology companies, particularly in satellites, for by various investors that were listed on the other page, whether they're the best investors of the world, Google Ventures of the world, whoever else, looking for a large amount, willing to fund large amounts of funding, build businesses who are both established, i.e., they have a product, they have a goal, they have a mission, there is not technology risk, but are looking for large amounts of capital to, fund, uh, to finance future growth and even provide some liquidity. And lastly, or almost lastly, is on the public market side, which, while it's struggled, um, uh, of late, have very much been a historical focus or a historical avenue for some larger scale businesses to raise larger amounts of funding um, from both public and private investors and provide additional liquidity. And lastly, and most importantly, I think what the biggest area is often overlooked, and I think it's one thing that I think Alex kind of hit on most, it's up to all of us here to kind of really push on, is government funding. And these work for both larger and small companies, but particularly helpful for specific, specific project funding. The idea here on a lot of this, uh, on a lot of these capital raising, is getting from the beginning to the end. The public markets are very much designed for larger, more mature organizations to kind of tackle that next level of growth. But what I would say, the preeminent partner throughout that entire process is government and local resources that should be able to fund along the way and really you be utilized as a way to get that extra financial capital investment, get that extra growth equity investment, but not be the end all, be all and end all of all sorts of investing. And it's really up to all of us to kind of push uh, the government to help not just large players, but also small players in emerging technologies to help fund what hopefully um, will be large and expanding industry for both uh, for Canada and in the future. Um, so, uh, just uh, on a personal note, as, as I said, I've, I've been with BMO for a long period of time, I've seen a lot of evolution here uh, in the capital markets. I've never been ex as excited as I am today about the opportunity technology companies across the, the country have. Uh, on accessing capital both privately and publicly. I think it's all up to all of us to kind of push ourselves and, 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 and the banner as much as possible uh, across the world because Canada represents a very unique investment opportunity, particularly now more than ever. And I think uh, it, it's all on all of us to wherever our numbers may lie and wherever our uh, allegiances may lie to kind of push it, uh, push that capital home and really grow this business for the future.